Uh, he is the founder of uh, Water Resources Action Project, which focuses um, on working in the Middle East, um, looking at uh, constructing rainwater uh, harvesting systems in public schools. Um, so today he's going to be talking to us more about that. Um, and so for having me. I'll, uh, I'm just going to sit down. Actually, I think it'll be easy. Uh, so, I'm going to keep it rather informal. I keep a lot of uh, time at the end to do questions and answers, because uh, I'd rather focus more on that um, than just lecturing on you all. Uh, so, as Myrna suggested, I uh, was a founding member of the Water Resources Action Project, which we consider uh, referred to as RAP. Um, my day job uh, is I uh, co-founded an environmental consulting firm with Marianne Greco, who's a former action administrator for MKA. Uh, we're based out of DC. I've been doing that for almost 10 years. Focused mainly on uh, domestic water and waste issues. Um, hazardous waste, cleanups, transfer liability, uh, of continuing properties, uh, flood risk, uh, block and dam infrastructure, those kinds of things. Um, you know, I think it affects all of our lives on a daily basis, and it's, it's interesting to an extent. Uh, a lot of interfacing with the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Defense. Uh, but, you know, my real passion where I started out here in D.C. was in international development. Uh, but it doesn't often pay the bills. So, uh, fortunately, uh, I was able to be introduced to a number of former EPA uh, alumni uh, and other types of environmental uh, lawyers that wanted to look at how they could start giving back in this area of the world. Uh, so I got pulled into that meeting, and that was back in uh, 2000, 2008, uh, and the RAP was formed roughly in 2009 uh, as a 501c3. Uh, which was no small feat to do uh, when you're dealing in the Middle East. Uh, there's, uh, at least from what I've seen, uh, an additional amount of requirements that you have to go through in order to get a 501c3. So, uh, this group initially had a very broad focus. We wanted to look at how we can address some of the conflict in the Middle East. Um, and then, looking at that conflict, kind of came to the conclusion that many have that it's more so uh, the conflict is stimulated uh, from resource issues, uh, particularly water uh, and land to an extent. So then, because many of us had environmental backgrounds, water-related backgrounds, uh, we looked at how a purely volunteer group, because all of us were volunteering, we all had day jobs, uh, and really didn't have, I think, the time or the resources to stand up a nonprofit organization where we would have paid employees. Um, that was something that we considered down the road that we may want to do, but right now, purely volunteer. We've continued that to this day. Uh, so we looked at, you know, how could our group have an immediate impact on a very small budget? So then that took us to looking at rainwater harvesting, uh, which is nothing new in this part of the world. Uh, whether it's, it's Israel, Jordan, Palestine, you know, they've been using cisterns, underground reservoirs, to store water for thousands of years. Uh, rainwater harvesting that we're looking at uh, is more so storing the water in rain barrels, which is also done on a domestic level throughout the region. Uh, so, and there, it's, it's a low-cost technology, and it, in very simple technology to employ. So the way that we were able to get our funds is we have a board that's set up. The board contributes, each member contributes about $1,000 a year. Uh, I then work with a small group that tries to leverage those funds through some small grants where we've been able to raise you know, anywhere between twenty dollars to $30,000 a year. Not a lot of funds when you look at some of these big nonprofits. But it's been able to allow us to put one project on the ground roughly per year. Um, what that project looks like is us going into a school in an underprivileged area and 
constructing a rainwater harvesting system where it would collect water on the roof of the school and store them in a series of rain barrels, or to an extent an underground cistern when we're operating in Palestine. Uh, that then, that water is pumped to the restrooms in the school and is used for toilet flushing, which is one of the main consumers of water on any site, particularly a school. So the school benefits because they have greater water security, uh, reduced water bills, which can be a, a pretty large portion of their budget each year. And then, you know, essentially what we do is we also employ an environmental education piece to this, to where we use the rainwater harvesting system as a tool to promote the value of water conservation in the school. Now, the really, I think what our group is tasked with is environmental peace building. Um, but if you're really, I think, striving towards promoting peace in any area, you're not going in and really flagging that. You know, you're not saying I'm here to, to you know, promote peace. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people that don't want that, or they just think it's too fluffy. So really, what we, our goal has been, and it's been, you know, since 2009, getting it up to the point to where we can actually start doing some of this cross-cultural exchange, which is what our group is all about. So the idea is, is to establish a network of very diverse schools in Israel, in Palestine, and in Jordan. This is kind of the geographic area that we focused on. And using, through rainwater harvesting and other types of environmental science activities, using these as tools to have children from these different diverse schools begin to interact. So you're not just bringing kids together that otherwise would completely avoid interaction and getting them in a room and not, you know, having, I think, some very substantive things for them to work on. Uh, we chose water and kind of the shared environment, how our decisions uh, can really impact people in, in other parts of the world, other parts of the region. Uh, and using that as a platform to have the children interact on a regular basis. So what that looks like is throughout the year, we establish uh, in-person and virtual exchanges amongst the diverse schools that we uh, established as project partners. Um, right now, currently, the RAP schools that we're working in uh, we have two in East Jerusalem, we have uh, two in Palestine, just outside of Bethlehem, we have two in Northern Israel, and then we're going to have three in Jordan, just outside of Ramallah. Uh, so that's the schools that we directly provide funding to, but through partnerships, um, particularly through, uh, I'm very active in Rotary, uh, I don't know if you know in Rotary, uh, but they have a program that we help to establish called Kids Across Waters. Essentially the same premise, uh, but it's working solely currently within Israel itself. Um, but that has allowed us to include an additional 12 schools in what it is that we're doing. And next year it's going to include, I think, an additional 10. So when you look at between now and the end of next year, we're going to be operating in 30 schools roughly uh, throughout Israel, Palestine, and Jordan. Uh, you know, some are, are Jewish, some are Muslim, some are Christian, some are Druze. Uh, and what we do is we have these in-person field trips throughout the year, whether it's going to a desalination plant, a water reclamation plant, uh, looking at agricultural practices, uh, it can be going to a museum, uh, it can be visiting each other's schools to look at the rainwater harvesting system, how it's being used, how much water is being collected, and what that means to a school in terms of its savings. Uh, what we've seen is that over time, it, it is resulting in, in a positive impact. Uh, I've seen things just that are as basic as having two children that would just completely avoid any interaction at all and have these preconceived notions and these prejudices uh, interact with one another to the point where they would say, you know, after this project's over, I want to continue engaging with this other student. Uh, whether that's over email or Facebook or you know, other means. Uh, but it's beginning to break down some of those barriers. Uh, now, 
just, there, there are a number of challenges. And we faced this, and I think it's been kind of a reality check over the course of the last few years, is we've been able to be effective in promoting cross-cultural exchange within certain countries and between diverse populations. It's exceedingly difficult to do that cross-border. Uh, there are a number of groups that are doing it, um, but, for instance, the Ministry of Education in Palestine and in Israel, it's just forbidden. It's not permitted. I, I cannot have a joint field trip under the auspices of the school where those students and those teachers, faculty, go and interact within school hours. I, and just the permits involved and other things to actually cross border it gets very complicated. And for a group that's volunteer, such as there are and operating in the United States, it's beyond our reach. Um, so what we've really tried to do now when dealing with cross border is looking at virtual means to do that. Uh, it can be different types of online activities, blogging, which can be very controlled, uh, to where a uh, a classroom would have environmental education activity that they would do in their school, uh, you know, almost like a lab where they would post their findings online, the reactions, uh, how they went about doing it, the results, and they would post that and then a class in, for instance, the United States or in Israel would do the same. Uh, and you would have some back and forth exchanges to where now the students, they are providing their input, uh, they're receiving and viewing input from other students, they're having that interaction and it's virtual. Uh, and more so, what we're now trying to do is, and, and there is an organization doing this somewhat effectively, but looking at after school programs and being able to bridge that gap and do in-person meetings after school, because you can do whatever you want on your own time. Uh, again, very challenging because, you know, put yourself in the shoes of a parent, you know, are, are they going to feel comfortable, you know, having their child go cross border uh, into this unknown territory where, you know, it's scary, I think, for them, for their children, uh, how they will be received. Um, so there's, there's been some challenges along the way, but we're working through that. There are some groups, uh, one here that's local, the U.S. Institute for Peace, that has been engaged in uh, gaming activities. Uh, you know, whether it's like Warcraft, I hate using that word, war here. Um, but different types of online games where you would have these students work together to solve problems. Uh, so we're seeing, I think, a, a gravitation towards those types of activities. Um, so I think in essence, that that's really what, what we've been doing and where we see the opportunity going forward. Uh, the video that I'd like to, to show you now was done actually um, uh, by NASA. They have a development program there. It, it's essentially a group of, of students uh, over the summer that engage in a project. And we work with them to look at, uh, in the past, RAP has based a lot of its decisions on where to work, uh, on do we have a representative there in the community, in the school, that's willing to really step up and take the lead and be our eyes and ears on the ground. Uh, that's just been a huge factor, and it continues to be. Um, but through the NASA program, a lot of the sensing and other things, uh, GIS that they've been able to employ, they've been able to use it uh, and help us to look, I think, um, in a way where we're factoring in rainfall patterns, uh, we're looking at groundwater data. We're, we're trying to be able to base our future project decisions on, more so on need uh, and where these rainwater harvesting systems could really be effective. Uh, so that's been something I think that's further informed what it is that we're doing. And they did a really just, I think, a good job uh, in a short video of kind of summarizing some of the things that they did that I'd like to show you. And then I can very quickly just tick through the PowerPoint I have. It's more so, I think, just to show you some pictures of what it is that I'm talking about. Uh, and then from there, I'm going to stop, and I would just much rather field questions from you all about rap, about
about what we're doing in the Middle East. Uh, and then more broadly, uh, because I work in an environmental consulting firm and we do a lot of domestic water stuff as well, if there, I think it's anything just on a more broader, uh, you know, whether it's water, whether it's different types of environmental issues, uh, generally, I, I feel like I could probably confidently answer those as well. Um, so, with that said, I think this was working. in an area which humans have inhabited for thousands of years. Once part of the Fertile Crescent, this region of the Middle East was one of the most fertile areas in the world. Due to its ideal climate of growing crops, its abundance of natural water bodies, and regular and predictable seasonal rains. Currently, the Middle East is home to 6.3% of the global population, but it contains only 1.4% of the world's renewable fresh water. This has led to severe water scarcity in the region as a combination of population growth and urbanization that led to over-exploitation of aquifers and the contamination of water resources. Changes in climate may further decrease availability or accessibility of water resources, which could result in hindered economic growth and consequently increased poverty, social instability, and food insecurity. One way to increase water resources is rainwater harvesting, which has been implemented in the region for millennia. When rainwater comes into contact with the surface, it is directed to a point where it then flows into a barrel or cistern. A network of pipes connects the rain barrels or cisterns to the plumbing in the school, so that when water is needed for sanitation purposes, the harvested rainwater is used. The Water Resources Action Project, or RAP as we refer to it, uh, is a purely volunteer uh, group of environmental professionals that uh, are utilizing rainwater harvesting systems in the Middle East uh, to provide impoverished schools and the communities that they operate within with greater water security. The Middle East Water Resources Development Team at the NASA Langley Research Center created a precipitation climatology using the Tropical Rainfall Measurement Mission, the Global Precipitation Measurement, and other NASA Earth observations data to quantify and visualize monthly precipitation rates to identify the locations most suitable for rainwater harvesting. In addition, the team created PRIME, a precipitation interface for the Middle East. In order to create PRIME, we process and upload precipitation, groundwater, and evacuate transpiration data, <coughs> as well as the shape files for school locations and a study area into Google Earth Engine API. We then use JavaScript to create the graphical user interface for Prime, which RAP and its partner schools can interact with by the click of a button. Prime can also incorporate new, near real time data and continue to monitor precipitation and other important variables to the water cycle in the region. Finally, from the output data generated by Prime's graphs, we conducted several statistical analyses to see if there were any correlations between the model and climatic variables. Resources and apply them in the communities where these schools are suffering from, I think, some of the most dire water shortages. With the help of our tool, we're to provide rainwater harvesting materials where they're needed most. Certainly a broader impact uh, 
than I ever imagined a volunteer group having. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go through, not really the, the text, um, but more so, I think just some of the images can be helpful. Uh, but as you can see, the Jordan River is flowing through uh, the geographic area that we're working in. I mean, it's, it's no secret. I mean, I've seen it myself. I wouldn't even call it a river at this point in time. Uh, it's more just a, a sewage canal. Um, the agricultural runoff, industrial uses has really uh, made it unusable uh, in a lot of extents. So one thing that you really see, particularly in the West Bank and in Jordan, uh, you can see a tanker truck on the bottom. A lot of the schools that we're working with then, they only have so much water to use each day. Not really the case now with desalination in Israel. Um, but uh, once they get to the end of that, uh, of what they have in supply, you know, for a week or a day's time, that's it. Uh, their only other option is essentially one of these tanker trucks will come around and they can purchase water at an exorbitant rate, basically to bridge the gap until they have um, uh, another delivery. Um, it, uh, it puts these schools, I've seen particularly in Jordan, in a spot where they, they simply cannot have a continuity of operations. Uh, they may have school a couple days a week, uh, and I think it's exceedingly difficult to, to be able to carry on and have school during these drought periods, which, uh, as that NASA team highlighted, and it's so true, uh, between April and August, there, there is no rain. And I would argue that it's probably more so, you know, the rainy season starting like in November and ending in April. Uh, so I think what, what, I've, what I really enjoy about RAP and the things that we're doing uh, is it has provided in a lot of these schools the opportunity for them to do summer camps, uh, for them to be able to use the water for gardening uh, and other types of things at the school. Uh, yeah, you know, it, by no means is it, is it enough. I, I don't think there could ever be enough rain barrels that you could have on the site to really provide the school with what it needs throughout the year. Um, but the cisterns that, that we have constructed, they have the benefit of holding uh, a lot more water, up to I think, over 60,000 liters, uh, which can really, it can make an impact. Whereas on the rim barrels, it's more around 20,000 liters. Uh, there's trade-offs between each of those, which I can get into of why we do rain barrels and, one country as opposed to another or certain areas. Um, but I would get into that unless, unless you all invite to, and I can talk about it later. But <coughs> these are what the kind of two systems would look like. <coughs> On the left, you have the rain barrels. This is what a project would look like here. Um, and then on the right, that's not a good picture of what a system looks like. It is the one to be constructed, but I'll show you in a later one. Uh, and then you can see on the, the toilet there, the, the blue line at the top is the line that runs from the barrels to the back of the toilet. Uh, and then there's a number of, of education activities, workshops that are done after school, which is reflected in that picture in the middle. So this was our pilot school. East Jerusalem. Uh, it was an absolute success and continues to be, uh, I think, one of our just premier schools. Uh, the reason is, is that there is a very committed math and science teacher in the school. The principal's very committed. Uh, they are very innovative in the environmental education activities that they do. And it wasn't as if the rainwater harvesting system we provided, you know, was the foundation for that. It was more so that they had a lot of this good energy and these things going on in the school, and we really just served, I think, as a catalyst for them to do more uh, and to get ex further excited about it and to provide additional financial support to where uh, we try to incentivize them uh, each year to where if there's certain lab equipment, other things that they need, we provide funding for that. Um, and in return, they give us monthly reports that the students do on you know, how much water is being conserved, uh, what those savings look like at the school. And, you know, as you can imagine, you know, these teachers are only paid to do what you know, they're, they need to do during regular school hours. RAP is often viewed as, I think, above and beyond. So by providing some of those incentives for some of the teachers, and we've seen this in other schools, not this one, where you really have to provide that incentive, 
um, for them to want to go above and beyond. And, you know, to an extent, it's not a comfortable setting sometimes to do a field trip where you are leaving the comfort of your community, uh, for instance, East Jerusalem, to go into Israel proper, uh, which could be, uh, you know, primarily a Jewish community. Um, you know, it takes some incentive and it takes some resources to, to I think, move them away from being frightened about doing that and to, to begin to have uh, some comfort. So this is a very dated chart, but it shows you just the amount of water that's been consumed over the years uh, by the rainwater harvesting system. Uh, it's, it's a significant amount, I would argue. Uh, and I need to update the numbers. But in their volunteer organization, you know, it kind of gets put kind of, as not a priority um, sometimes. I don't know why it's doing that. But these just shows the different stages of the project at our second school, which is also in East Jerusalem, uh, the Alcock School for the Learning Disabled. Same, same type of project. Uh, but we've been able to see that, you know, these schools, through this rain barrel hardness assistance, uh, is able to save, you know, I think, roughly about 60% of, of what it is, the water that they're consuming, that goes to toilet flushing during the rainy season. And a similar type of chart there to demonstrate the savings. So, you can't really see this schematic. Uh, I think there's a better picture, but um, this is the tier school that we're working in. Uh, it's just outside of Bethlehem. Uh, you can see the excavation that's required to do a cistern. I mean, if I had my way, I think, you know, there's trade-offs. Uh, the cistern, you're able to certainly save a lot more water, um, but it's a lot more expensive. Uh, you know, excavating concrete, uh, it drives up the cost from an average uh, rain barrel system being, say, ten to 15000 uh, to a cistern being from fifteen to thirty thousand. Uh, so for a small volunteer organization, that's that's a big difference, uh, and it's also culture uh, and permit. In Israel, uh, you know, there's not the space oftentimes to dig a large, massive hole and install an underground cistern. You know, not the case in Palestine, where there's plenty of space right now uh, because of other development and other things, uh, and you know, we've seen through the Palestinian culture that they're much more comfortable with cisterns, whereas the Israelis really prefer the rain barrel uh, systems. So some cultural differences there. Now, one big trade-off of why I prefer the rain barrel parts and systems is I think that it's, it's much more effective on the educational aspect. Uh, for the children to be able to go out, read the measurements, uh, you know, and track the savings, uh, the maintenance involved, and a lot more straightforward. And a cistern, which I think can be forgotten sometimes. It's underground, you don't think about it, it's just there. You know, and you don't think about it unless a pump breaks or something along those lines. So for educational purposes, so you can see this is what it kind of took uh, to build the cistern. Next one. So this is kind of looking ahead at some some different partnerships that we have involved. The Arava Institute, uh, which is in the Negev, the southern region of Israel, uh, very active environmental studies, I think more progressive uh, type of, of institution that really does promote cross-cultural exchange uh, with Jordan as well. Uh, they have a, a program that solely looks at, at transboundary water management. Uh, we partnered with the, the director program as well. Uh, so they have had a program, uh, Youth Environmental and Education Peace Initiative, which is focused solely on the pairing of these different schools. Now, if I were you know, to play devil's advocate here, the problem with programs such as these that I would say are volunteer organization, uh, because we're funded through our board and, and other means, uh, you know, we can kind of distance ourselves from some of the risks that are involved of not getting read up on funding. I mean, Arava, just like you know, George Mason here, uh, if your funding dries up, the program dries up. And that is what happened in the case here of Arava. Uh, they got a lot of money from USAID. They 
can get it the next year, we pulled the plug on everything. Uh, we had already made financial commitments to the schools in the north uh, that, are, that are listed right here. Uh, you know, these, these schools have rainwater harvesting systems that we help purchase and we're continuing to work with them. Uh, it's been very challenging because we were going to rely heavily on our above for the educational outreach piece. So, you know, some, some roadblocks along the way, uh, certainly. Uh, next projects, this PowerPoint is dated by about a year. Uh, <laughs> the top one uh, in Jordan, that is going to be finished, uh, I think, any week now. Uh, it's being constructed. The one down from that, the al Sadiq School, that was finished uh, in February of this year. So, quite some time ago. Uh, so it's, it's up and running and, and doing its thing. Um, Eco Peace is one of the partners that, that we work with. They have offices in Amman, in Tel Aviv, uh, and in Bethlehem. They've been an effective partner of ours. Uh, really our eyes, ears on the ground, uh, particularly when we work in Palestine. So, next project, I mentioned Rotary has a Cross Waters program. That's really been able to help us broaden our efforts in Israel. Uh, it's allowed us to, I think, have the reach in an additional 10 schools that are very diverse. It's a very well-run program. The kind of phase two of it is going to be commenced uh, this coming school year, and it should broaden it out to uh, just over 20 schools. Uh, but very effective as well. And you can see on the bottom picture there, that's one of these joint field trips that I described. This is an ancient water well that the, the kids go to. Uh, you know, they learn about physics. They learn about water management. Uh, it's used, again, as a substantive platform to get these children to engage in person. And then you have virtual other types of follow-on and preparatory activities that they're engaged in to stimulate that communication as well. Um, but I've, I've seen a lot of programs, not just in the Middle East, but everywhere, where they do these cross-cultural exchange programs, but it's not very substantive. And they just try to throw kids in a room and get them to interact. Um, and it doesn't oftentimes work. Uh, I think there really needs to be something substantive that they're working on. And shared environmental issues, I think, is a, is a great fit. So lessons learned, I, I've talked about this, um, but you know, the committed school, the community leadership, that's, that's key. Uh, focusing on education, I think that helps sustain it and really broaden it out beyond just installing a rainwater harvesting system. Uh, grassroots partners, that's, we have to do that. You know, being a volunteer organization, there's no way we can do it without that. Um, you know, proven contractors, routine maintenance, again, very important. You know, you see this in Africa and hear these horse stories all the time about, uh, you know, these NGOs that go over there and they install uh, these, you know, these wells and all these things, and after a year, they don't work. Because uh, they didn't provide funding for future maintenance. Uh, they didn't have, educate, I think, the community on how to maintain these systems. So we, in any budget that we do, we make sure that there is funds allocated to that, and that whether it's the janitorial services there, headmaster, teacher, uh, you know, rainwater harvesting systems generally are very low technology. They're simple, which is why we employ them. Uh, I think any person, uh, not just you know, an engineer, can identify issues if they do exist and be able to address them. And we've seen that happen. Uh, continued follow-up and reporting is, is obviously very important as well. Um, and then identifying the end which I think in our case, the end game has always been to establish a strong network of schools in Israel, Palestine, Jordan, and the US, uh, and be able to connect these schools in person whenever possible, um, but more realistic, it's going to be a cross-border co-op virtual. Um, and that's just, right now, the limitations that we have to adhere to. So what makes us unique, I guess our pitch here, uh, we are purely volunteer. I, you know, I love being able to say that. Uh, I can't imagine just you know, how, how many organizations I've seen, these nonprofits, uh, that pay these high salaries and you know, give out all of these different trinkets. It's just 
waste a lot of money that don't go directly to the projects. And I fully understand that you have to have salaries, you have to have these things, because it's the only way to be able to have a fully sustained organization. Uh, you know, fortunately, we've been able to do that volunteer uh, through having very active, passionate folks um, that are committed to the cause. Uh, no secret, number of challenges that go along with that, and trying to keep that, that you know, excitement high and to keep those volunteers fully engaged. Um, but here's just a, a few of the things about our group. And lastly, just to, you know, we do we have Facebook, Twitter, all that good stuff. Um, probably should manage it and keep it a lot more lively than we do. Um, there's our website. I'd certainly encourage you to check that out because we have a lot of resources on there. Uh, we do look for volunteers. Uh, we have been engaged on some occasions with student groups where we had a group, um, the NASA one, I think is a shining example of one that worked. Uh, we had one from the University of Maryland that was okay. Um, we had others that weren't good. Uh, and this goes the same with volunteers. So I would, I would just say that if you are an individual uh, capacity or if you're motivated to have a group of students get together and you know, work together on a project that we have, uh, reach out to me. But if you're not serious, don't. <laughs> don't waste my time, don't waste your time. I've seen enough of these, these, these students. They, they are excited, and then they reach out to you, and then once you know, there's some real work involved, then you know, that's, it kind of goes to the wayside. Um, so I'm going to end it there. If, if anybody has any questions, I certainly am here to answer whatever you like. Uh, we will, I would advise if you want to just follow our group, is uh, we have a year-end newsletter for RAP that we do that summarizes kind of an annual report, and that is on our website. I think it's the last two years is available, and then this one coming up will come out in the next couple of weeks. Uh, that's a great way to just keep track of what we're doing, and I think in this latest newsletter, we are going to kind of formally put out there some different internship opportunities uh, in some different areas that we need assistance with are interested. And then I will just mention on the Harinko group side, which is the environmental consulting firm that I work with, uh, we're going to be putting out a similar uh, internship announcement uh, at the end, I think in the next couple of weeks. And you can sign up for our newsletter as well. On our website, it's the harinkogroup.org. Uh, and that uh, is also great if you want to track domestic water environmental types of issues um, that we're dealing with. So, I ended with that. Yeah.